excited to be here. My name is Stephen Grizzle, and I lead the Fullerton sector. Man, it's hard to come up right after Andre sings like that. It's ridiculous. But guys, we're going to get into the Bible. And, you know, there's no better way to come back to Campus Devotional than to study out one of the worst people in the Bible. <laughs> we're going to be studying out Saul today. Turn your Bible over to 1 Samuel chapter 11. And we're going to start off in verse 12. <laughs> and right before this, you see Saul has an incredible victory for God. It says in verse 12, The people then said to Samuel, Who was it that asked, Shall Saul reign over us? Turn these men over to us so that we may put them to death. But Saul said, no one may be put to death today. For this day the Lord has rescued Israel. Then Samuel said to the people, come, let us go to Gilgal, and there renew the kingship. So all the people went to Gilgal and made Saul king in the presence of the Lord. There they sacrificed fellowship offerings before the Lord, and Saul and all the Israelites held a great celebration. You know, this is such an incredible victory for God. And they go up to Gilgal and they confirm Saul is the king. You know, Gilgal was actually the same exact place where they reconfirmed the covenant of God with circumcision. But Saul was a man with so much promise. I mean, it says this man was taller than the rest. It says he was handsome. He was filled with the spirit. Most scholars believe this guy looked exactly like Femi. Except Femi is a lot more spiritual. All right. Yet with all of the promise, the people still doubted. Is this really the guy to do it? You know, last year we saw incredible miracles for God. I mean, promising ones. 500 baptisms. We saw 1,000 for the Lord. But we would be absolute fools if we were not to believe that people outside of these walls are not doubting, can we really do it? Actually, we would be fools to not believe that there might be some people inside of these walls that are doubting, is this really the group to do it? You know, we know how Saul's story ends. He ends up going from confirmed to condemned. But in 1 Corinthians 10, verse 6, it says, Now these things occurred as examples to keep us from setting our hearts on the evil things as they did. So as we read this, and as we see the highs and we see the lows of Saul, understand that as we do this, this is so we could go from confirmed and not condemned. The title of my lesson is Confirmed or Condemned. My first point is think fast. If we want to be confirmed and not condemned, we got to think fast. Go to verse 1. It says in verse 1, Nahash the Ammonites went up and besieged Jabesh Gilead. And all the men of Jabesh said to him, Make a treaty with us, and we will be subject to you. But Nahash the Ammonite replied, I will make a treaty with you only on one condition, that I gouge out the right eye of every single one of you. And so bring disgrace on all of Israel. The elders of Jabez said to him, just give us seven days so we may send a messengers through Israel. And if no one comes to rescue us, we will surrender to you. Let's just stop here for a second. You know, it says the Ammonites, they offer a treaty. 
And you know, why is this treaty so bad? They say, hey, we're going to gouge out the right eye of every single one of you guys. You know, most of the warriors would have been right-handed. So this would have brought disgrace because basically they would have had a blind side and they wouldn't have, wouldn't have actually been able to fight the battles. It's like, hey, we'll make a treaty, but none of you guys are going to be able to fight. And I believe this kind of showed where they were at spiritually. Is that they were so scared to die that they would rather give up their ability to fight. But this is the same exact thing with life. Is God says you just have to die to yourself. And here's the thing. There's so many people that would rather, instead of dying to themselves, instead of following God, they'd rather live a purposeless, meaningless, absolute nothing of a life. God says don't take the treaty. Don't give in to the slavery. Just think fast. You see, Satan's going to attack. 100% he's going to attack. But here's the thing. God always gives us a chance to be quicker. It says, he get, hey, I'll give you seven days. They could have just killed him right there. But at the end of the day, Satan's going to attack. And God's like, man, I will give you a chance. You just have to think fast. Let's keep reading in verse 4. It says, when the messengers came to Gibeah of Saul and reported these terms to the people, they all wept aloud. Just then Saul was returning from the fields behind his oxen and asked, what is wrong with everybody? Why are they weeping? Then they repeated to him what the men of Jabesh had said. When Saul heard their words, the Spirit of God came powerfully upon him. And he burned with anger. He took a pair of oxen, cut them into pieces, and sent the pieces by messengers throughout Israel, proclaiming, this is what would be done to the oxen of anyone who does not follow Saul and Samuel. Then the terror of the Lord fell on the people, and they came together as one man. When Saul mustered them at Bezek, the men of Israel numbered 300,000, and those of Judah 30,000. They told the messengers who had come, say to the men of Jabesh Gilead, by the time the sun is hot tomorrow, you will be rescued. Yeah. When the messengers went and reported this to the men of Jabesh, they were elated. They said to the Ammonites, tomorrow we will surrender to you, and you could do to us whatever you'd like. The next day Saul separated his men into three divisions. During the last watch of the night, they broke into the camp of the Ammonites and slaughtered them until the heat of the day. Those who survived were scattered so that no two of them were left together. Wow. You see, Saul here, he gets absolutely indignant. He's like wondering, like, why is everybody so afraid right now? You know God's on our side, right? And he thinks fast. He, he gets this oxen, and he cuts it up into pieces, a little slice and dice right there. And he sends it to all the people to make them urgent. But why exactly does he do this? I started thinking, like, that's kind of a weird, it's honestly kind of a weird thing to do. It's because he remembered a story that actually happened in his own hometown of Gibeah. You see, in Judges 19, it talks about a man whose concubine was raped and killed. And it was in the town of Gibeah. The people of Gibeah were so wicked and so terrible and this man sees his concubine that laid there dead. And what he does is he grabs the concubine and he cuts her into pieces. And he sends each piece to all the tribes of Israel. And the people were so angry to see what had happened that it says they come together as one man. And they go against the people of Gibeah and absolutely destroy them. So what did Saul do? He saw the same way that his own hometown, his own people got defeated. He used this strategy and he went to fight against these people. It says Saul assembled 330,000 men altogether as one man. And he would have just done this in a couple of days 
Why do we know this? Because they only had seven days to get everybody together. And it would have sent, you know, maybe a day or two just to get the messenger there and them to get to the battlefield. So literally he gets everybody together in just a short amount of time. You know, there's just a certain unity that happens when everybody's urgent. There's a certain unity that happens and an urgency that happens when you think you're going to lose something. I mean, all of these people were like, man, I'm, I'm going to lose my oxen. I'm going to lose some money. And when you feel like you're going to lose something, you just get a sense of urgency to you. You know, it says they marched through the night. And it says they get there in the last watch, which would have been around 3 a.m. to 6 a.m. And they slaughter the Ammonites. When you think fast, you will catch the enemy off guard. There's not like ifs, thans, buts. You will catch them off guard. But here's the thing. If we don't think fast, we are going to lose something as well. We are going to lose the souls that we could have saved. And that's a promise. That every single day there's people dying. That every single day there's people just rapidly disappearing. And if we don't do something about it, if we don't understand that if we don't come together as one man, and we don't fight together, that they will die. You know, last year, I was in a Bible study. And I was just pleading with this guy to give up everything. And I was, I, I was pouring my heart out to him. And he just didn't get it. He's like, man, I, I, I don't want to do this. I'm scared. I don't know what's going to happen to me. And I showed him Luke 9. I even think Esai was in the study with me. And I'm like, man, just what is it to gain the whole world? And yet lose or forfeit your very self. What is it to gain everything in the world? But, but just give up everything, please. And as I'm studying the Bible with him, I get a message. And it's from my best friend, Paco. And it's from my friend's mom that played baseball with me. And it was that my friend passed away. And I remember picking up my phone, and I believe it was completely of God that I read my phone during Bible study. <laughs> And I want to, <laughs> amen. <laughs> but I want to read the message just to give you the idea. It says, just wanted to let you know that early this morning, the Mountain View police came by our house and told us that CJ was killed in a car accident in Santa Barbara last night. He was the passenger in a car that hit a tree. He was 22. I'm sorry to be blunt, but this is the only way I'm able to get this news out without bursting into tears every two seconds. If you could tell your kids, and they're free to tell others, I have no way to tell Paco, Zach, and Grizz. I think Michael knows how to let them know. I would appreciate it. I remember showing this message to the guy that was studying the Bible. And even after all the pleading and just trying to get this guy to get the idea, he still walked away sad, unwilling to give up everything. But I remember walking away from that time, and the one thing I was worried about was I don't think I ever shared my faith with that guy. I don't think I ever shared my faith one time. And I hope that, you know, he, he started coaching at Santa Barbara Community College. We have a ministry there. I just hoped and pleaded maybe he just got a shot. Maybe just one person gave him a shot, reached out to him. But if we don't think fast, guys, guys, we never know when Satan's going to attack. We never know. And if you're here right now, and this is your first time out, maybe you're studying the Bible. Guys, you do not know when Satan's going to attack in your life. You have to make a decision right now. Don't say I'm going to hold it off to next year. Not the next few years. Make a decision right now. I am going to think fast. And if you're a disciple, 
you know, how he attacked this camp is it says he split them up in three groups. Why? Because it wasn't just him that was thinking fast, but all of his people were thinking fast. You know, don't just allow the per person that leads your campus, your leader, to be the one thinking fast, caring about the lost. I challenge every single Bible talk, every single person here, I am going to have goals so I can think fast. Turn your Bible over to 1 Samuel 15. And now we're going to see Saul tank out a little bit. Amen. He was doing good. He was doing good. In verse 1 it says, Samuel said to Saul, I am the one the Lord sent to anoint you king over his people Israel. So listen now to the message of the Lord. This is what the Lord Almighty says. I will punish the Amalekites for what they did to Israel when they waylaid them as they came up out of Egypt. Egypt. Now go attack the Amalekites and totally destroy all that belongs to them. Do not spare them. Put to death men and women, children and infants, cattle and sheep, camels and donkeys. So Saul summoned the men and mustered them at Telaim, 200,000 foot soldiers and 10,000 from Judah. Saul went to the city of Amalek and set an ambush in the ravine. Then he said to the Kenites, go away. Leave the Amalekites so that I do not destroy you along with them. For you showed kindness to all the Israelites when they came up out of Egypt. So the Kenites moved away from the Amalekites. Then Saul attacked the Amalekites all the way from Havilah Ashur, near the eastern border of Egypt. He took Agag, king of the Amalekites, alive and all the people he totally destroyed with the sword. But Saul and the army spared Agag and the best of the sheep of the cattle, the fat calves and lambs, everything that was good. These they were unwilling to destroy completely. But everything that was despised and weak was totally destroyed. Then the word of the Lord came to Samuel. I regret that I have made Saul king because he has turned away from me and has not carried out my instructions. Samuel was angry and he cried out to the Lord all night. Early in the morning, Samuel got up and he went to meet Saul. But he was told Saul has gone to Car Carmel. There he has set up a monument in his own honor and has turned and gone into Gilgal. When Samuel reached him, Saul said, the Lord bless you. I've carried out the Lord's instructions. But Samuel said, what then is this bleeding of sheep in my ears? What is this lowing of cattle that I hear? Saul answered, the soldiers brought them from the Amalekites. They spared the best of the sheep and the cattle to sacrifice to the Lord your God. And we totally destroyed the rest. Enough, Samuel said to Saul. Let me tell you what the Lord has said to me last night. Tell me, Saul replied. Samuel said, although you were once small in your own eyes, did you not become the head of the tribe of Israel? The Lord anointed you king over Israel. And he sent you on a mission saying, go and completely destroy those wicked people, the Amalekites. Wage war against them until you have wiped them out. Why did you not obey the Lord? Why did you pounce on the plunder and do evil in the eyes of the Lord? But I did obey the Lord, Saul said. I went on the mission the Lord signed me. I completely destroyed the Amalekites and brought back Agad, their king. The soldiers took the sheep and the cattle from the plunder, the best of what was devoted to God, in order to sacrifice them to the Lord, your God, at Gilgal. But Samuel replied, Does the Lord delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as much as obeying the Lord? To obey is better than sacrifice, and to heed is better than the fat of rams. Yeah. For rebellion is like the sin of divination, and arrogance like the evil of idolatry. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he has rejected you as king. Yeah. I mean, you just see a hard fall from Saul here. I mean, he partially does what God tells him to do. He just does the convenient part. He's like, what's the easiest part I could do? What's the part that I already wanted to get away, away with? But let me keep the things that could actually benefit me. You see, why did Saul fall? I believe it's, the answer is right there all along. It was the monument. My second point 
is smash the monument. You see, it says he was once small in his own eyes. But now he builds a monument and it's huge in his eyes. It's like, I just want to look at myself now. Like before I was small, but now I just, it's all about me. You know, in Hebrew, monument is actually the word yad, which means hand. And the only other person to build this hand was another terrible guy, Absalom. And what this would have been is they would have built this monument, they would have built this statue, and they would have put an engraving of their hand in the monument. And I believe this was very symbolic of what they were going through. Why? Because they were saying the battle I just won, the victory we just had, that was not by the hand of God, but that was by my hands. I was the one that did that. I'm great. God's not great. That's why he even says the Lord your God. He doesn't say the Lord my God. You see, Saul was blind. He perceived the battle as a victory. You see, selfishness just blinds you. Why? Because you start to perceive pleasure as victory. You start to see things that benefit you as actually in the overarching scheme of things to be the greatest victory. But things that feel good are actually not always the things that are good. And we live in a world where people feed on it and they live as the motto, I'm going to go after things that please myself and not please God. Most darkness comes out of this theology. Just selfish desire. You know, I was watching a movie with some of the guys. And honestly, if you want to see the darkness in the world, I would tell you to watch this movie. It was Sound of Freedom. And the movie starts off, I mean, dark. This man, he, he's, he's with his two kids. And this woman comes up to him and, and says, hey, dude, your kid has so much talent. Bring, it, bring them over to the talent agency. Like, they could do incredible things. They can make so much money. It's going to be an awesome, awesome time. And he brings the kids over to it. And he comes back. And they're just gone. And through this movie, you just start to see people that just so love pleasure and are so selfish that just for money, just for the, the, the feeling, just feeling good, selling little kids into sex trafficking. And after I watched the movie, I kind of fell into like a rabbit hole of like watching videos and like looking at statistics and seeing that there is, you know, like 30 million kids at any given moment that are getting s sex trafficked right now as we speak. Wow. That America might not be the ones that actually give the kids, but it's actually the one that takes the kids the most. Wow. And I was watching this video, and it was a podcast, and it was of this guy who was like a hacker. In this guy, just one website out of like a million websites. He could find the people who are involved on this website so he could bust them and catch them. And he saw, like, politicians on there and all this wickedness on there. And he said, and the one that disturbed me the most, is on this website, there was a guy who took a picture of his own kid. And was selling their own kid. I mean, how selfish own kid that you don't care about anybody else you just care about money you just care about pleasure that much but this isn't the only part in the world guys all around us there's monuments built statues you just have to open your eyes look around there's people just Feeding their selfish desires. 
But we would be fools to think this is only something that happens in the world. This happens in the kingdom as well. Maybe not to the same extent. I'll tell you exactly what it looks like. You know, you don't want to get open anymore. Why? Because you just care about how people look at you. And you build it up. And you build it up. You start to not give God the glory, but you just, you just love the feeling of the glory and you build it up. Just everything starts to revolve around yourself. You stop having quiet times because you don't really have to rely on God's strength. You just have to rely on your own strength and you build it up and you keep stacking up the monument and then you have a decision to make as you see it high in the air. You could either bow down to your own statue or you could smash the monument. What is the monument in your life? I want you to write it down right now. What is the thing that is coming between you and your relationship with God? I want you to write it right now, and before you exit this door, you smash the monument. My third and final point, finish the task. Go down to verse 32. It says in verse 32, then Samuel said, bring me Agag, king of the Amalekites. Agag came to him in chains. And he thought, surely the bitterness of death is past. But Samuel said, as your sword has made woman childless, so your mother will be childless among women. What a savage right there. And Samuel put Agag to death before the Lord at Gilgal. Then Samuel left for Ramah, but Saul went up to his home in Gibeah of Saul. Until the day Samuel died, he did not go and see Saul again. Though Samuel mourned for him, and the Lord regretted that he had made Saul king over Israel. I mean, here you see Samuel. This guy was actually extremely hurt. Like, he actually really cared for Saul. This is, he's the one that raised him up. He appointed him. He really cared for him. It says that even though he didn't continue to talk to him, he still mourned for him. I'm sure he was praying for him. I'm, I'm, I'm sure he still hoped that his life ended up good. But he still grabs the king. And he brings them actually in front of Saul probably. Why? Because it doesn't say Saul left until after. And he says, okay, you don't want to finish the task. You don't want to do the thing that God called us to do. So right in front, in front of you, I'm going to show you how you finish the task. And he kills the king. Now, I believe this is what's, how it's going to be when we're on campus this year. I mean, every single year. That we're going to be like Samuel, and we're going to be hurt. <laughs> There's going to be people that we're studying with that walk away. There is going to be, especially at UCLA, a million people that say no to you. <laughs> There's going to be people that think you're crazy, wild. There's going to be people that you actually really care about that fall away, and then they end up persecuting you. And you have a decision to make. I have to finish the task. I want to look at not Saul, but I want to close out a, in a scripture of one of the people that persevered the most, and that's Paul. Go to Acts. Go to Acts chapter 16. In verse 1. Verse 1, it says, Paul came to Derby, and then to Lystra, where a disciple named Timothy lived whose mother was Jewish, and a believer, but whose father was a Greek. The believers at Lystra and Iconium spoke well of him. Paul wanted to take him along on the journey, so he circumcised him because of the Jews who lived there in that area, for they all knew that his father was a Greek. You see right here, you see that Paul ends up getting Timothy. Timothy ends up becoming a son in the faith, does incredible things, leads churches. This guy does so many awesome things. But that's not really what I want to focus on. I want to focus on how exactly did Paul get Timothy? 
Go to chapter 14. And in verse 8, he's back in Lystra. It says, in Lystra there sat a man who was lame. He had been that way from birth and never walked. He listened to Paul as he was speaking. Paul looked directly at him, saw that he had faith to be healed, and called out, stand up on your feet. At that, the man jumped up and began to walk. Go down to verse 19. (laughs) Then some Jews came from Antioch and Iconium and won the crowd over. They stoned Paul and dragged him outside the city, thinking he was dead. But after the disciples gathered around him, he got up, went back into the city the next day, and he and Barabbas left for Derby. I mean, he gets stoned. He gets messed up a little bit. But instead of walking away, he goes back into the city of Lystra, the same exact city that Timothy ends up getting met out. Here's the thing. If we're unwilling to get up after we see troubles, if we're unwilling to get up after we get stoned, if we're unwilling to get up after people say no, you might just miss that one person that's just waiting for you to share their faith with. I mean, Paul found himself in this, and he's like, hey, these people don't like me. They're mad at me, but I'm just going to go back into the city. I just got stoned, but I'm just going to go back into the city. This last semester, I I, I, uh, baptized somebody, and after I baptized him, I was like, hey, this is going to be my Timothy. Falls away. I baptize another guy. I'm like, man, this guy, this guy's going to be my Timothy. This guy's so awesome. He falls away. I baptize another guy. I'm like, man, this guy is so awesome. He falls away and then persecutes us. We had so many people write emails to try to get us off campus. The people even emailed the person who was overseeing our club to try to get us out of club status. I mean, we saw these things, but all we had to do was get back up and finish the task. And because we went back in, we got to see people like Mark get baptized. Happy birthday, Mark. We got to see people like Ty get baptized. There's going to be times when you just feel like giving in. You know, most people are in campaign season. We're about to be in campaign season. The thought that could come in your mind is, you know, the campaign that says share with 100 people a day. Well, after the second week, you know, I'm going to share with 50 people a day. Because it's just a little bit too hard. 6, 6 a.m. prayers, I don't really know about that. I, I'm gonna, maybe I'll show up at 6.30. But most people, sadly, just don't finish off the campaigns. Guys, I challenge you, every single last day of that campaign, you finish the task. Yeah. And if you're studying the Bible right now, it's going to be hard. You're dealing with things you've never dealt with before. You're confronting things in your past you've never confronted before. The temptation in Satan's going to tempt you to not finish the task. I tell you, study the Bible, get baptized, and finish the task. We have a decision to make today. You could either obey God's word and be confirmed, or you could disobey and be condemned. It's your decision.